Again, Dr. Lois Tiffany from the Botany and Plant Pathology Department, and I are down in Pamela Woods, and this is the same tree that we were talking of, about the last time, and we had some more to say about it, because right. we were talking at that particular time uh, of, the op of the leaves being opposite and the type of leaf and one whole... This is, this is one whole leaf, isn't That's it? That's right, one entire leaf. Right. But there are some other things that you don't have to necessarily have those leaves on that you showed me, that you could see that even if it were wintertime. Right. Now, if we go back to this branch here where we broke one leaf off to take a look at it a little more carefully, you can see that there's a nice, neat break area here. Mm -hmm. And this is where this leaf would have, that leaf would have fallen off this autumn. Now, this is called a leaf scar, obviously enough, and you can see the little bud right there just above the leaf scar. And it'll be bigger by next fall, but not much so. Now, if you look back here on the older part of this branch, if we get back into last, well, this is two-year-old area we're in here, actually. But you can see here's a leaf scar from last, from two years ago. And here, even better, on this branch that grew last year, you can see these great big leaf scars. Mm -hmm. And so, in the winter even, you can see that there are two leaf scars here opposite each other. So this opposite and alternate business one can check out not only when the leaves are in, on the tree, but via the leaf scars you can tell where they were in the winter time. So this is a good, good character um, to use any time of year actually. All right, now big question. Why does that little branch go off there? Why, why does a branch go off? Or twig or whatever you want to call it? <laughs> because that particular bud grew. Now, oh, okay. <laughs> many, many trees uh, have what we call apical dominance, and an end bud will grow, and the lateral buds, the ones back along the side, will remain dormant. But if uh, the top gets broken off, say if we cut this one off here, this bud, which is right here at this node by this leaf scar, would probably go ahead and grow, if not mm -hmm. this year, next year. So when you prune shrubbery uh, in the yard or something like this, you prune the ends off, and then the, the buds that normally wouldn't have grown otherwise will go ahead and develop. Well, now this one wasn't pruned, though. No, this one wasn't pruned. So this so is what just what happened. This is just natural. Something <laughs> happened. Uh, just uh, here. This one didn't. The one on this side didn't develop. And this one did. Uh huh. <laughs> and you notice there are lots of places back here along the, the where see there are bu pair of buds here. Right. There's a pair of buds here, and now, the, and none of these have developed. Now this has pretty uh, distinct uh, growth areas. Right. This. Now, the very green uh, branches right here are this year's growth. And yeah, did we say what kind this was? It's an ash. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the flecks here on this stem are called lenticels, and these are little corky areas which uh, permit the, the passage of gases from the cells inside the stem to the outside air and outside air gases into the stem. And you'll notice they look different here. Mm -hmm. You can still see them back here on the older branches also. Now, does insect problem uh, cause it not to grow as much? This would depend on the insect and on the particular plant. This would mm -hmm. vary with different combinations. Well, now, one thing I wanted to for us to go to this, because we were talking about, and uh, not what it is particularly, but you said that this, this is the, what, effect of an insect? Right. This is where an insect has actually eaten out the, the green cells of the leaf. Okay. So that, uh, and these are the, the green cells are the ones that make the food for the tree. So when they're eaten, uh, if, an, if enough insects ate enough green cells, then this tree would be in trouble. Mm -hmm. Now, another funny little one here. Where did it go? Did I step on it? This leaf right here, I think, is the one you were looking at. Yes, now that, that it looks like, you know, a little spider went by and left a little web. Now, I'm not an entomologist, right? but I think this is caused by an insect that's called a leaf miner. And it, it tunnels, actually, through the, through, through the leaf and eats out, again, the green cells. And so you see the little trails uh, where it's journeyed through the central part of the leaf. Now, um, as I said, I may be asking something that I shouldn't be asking you, but... Um, as it goes from here across this main vein, now did that cut off any of the food um, the traveling down to this vein and back? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know really how. Um, my impression is that they just eat the 
the green cells, which are relatively thin-walled cells, mm -hmm. and the cells which uh, actually transport materials are fairly thick-walled. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, I'm, I'm talking about something I don't know a lot about. <laughs> Now, as far as other trees, this is this, wait, this is a puny one. <laughs> this is a puny one, but it's one that um, is of interest. We were talking about poison ivy. Right. And this that was last time. That was last time. And we were pointing out that poison ivy has three leaflets mm -hmm. in each leaf. Well, this is a box elder, and it grows in the same kind of places poison ivy does frequently. And when you see this as a seedling tree with its three leaflets in each leaf, it sometimes can look very much like poison ivy. The edges of the leaf are, are cut in very much the same way. So now, does the box elder end up with the three leaves? Uh, some box elders have three leaflets on each leaf. Uh -huh. As you can see, this plant does fairly consistently. Some of them will have some threes, some leaves that have three leaflets, uh -huh. and some leaves that have five leaflets. And so that there is no, there just yeah. this is just natural, natural. variation. Yeah. But it does. I can definitely see yeah. why it would resemble yeah. the poison ivy. Now, one of yeah. the interesting things about box elder, it's sort of a scrawny tree. Uh, I mean, this one is, or all uh, box elders? Often they are. Oh. Uh, but it, it, you notice, it has opposite mm -hmm. uh, leaves here again, and it is actually in the maple group of, of plants. But it's the only maple that we have in this part of the world or in this, at least in the Midwest here, that has a compound leaf. All of our maples, both hard uh -huh. maples and soft maples, have simple leaves, like uh -huh. the ones we've talked right. about before. So this uh, is, is a peculiar maple. Now, as I say, this, this is one that looks like poison ivy when it's small. But now, we were talking about how poison ivy can grow, and it's not always on the ground. And this tree is a good example of how it can go up. Well, right. now, let's see if we can get it from the bottom. Now, the, uh, the vine that you can see growing up the, that oak tree there is actually a Virginia creeper vine. But if That's we a little five-leaf one. Right. But if we couldn't see the, the leaves on it right now, the vine itself, the stem growing up there, looks very much like a, a poison ivy vine. And grapevines, obviously, out in the woods look very much like this also. And don't use them to... <laughs> don't use them to swing on, right. no. Will you get the poison ivy from the bark? Or does it have to be from the leaf? Or do you know? You can, you can get it from any part of the plant, even the roots, mm -hmm. but uh, you have to come actually into, into contact with it. I mean, just walking by the tree right. or something like this would not be a problem. But contact with the roots or with the, the With bark. the stem or with the leaves, right. right. And uh, this has to, again, finish this section at least. And our guest has been, again, Dr. Lois Tiffany from the P Botany Plant Pathology Department. And maybe the next time we'll go on campus on some of the unusual trees. That's fine. Thank you. Again, we have with us Dr. Lois Tiffany of Botany and Plant Pathology. And the last time we were talking in the woods, we promised that we'd talk more about leaves. <laughs> but we've, we have discovered a leaf here that we better talk about first. We're going to getting poison ivy, we think. Now, the leaves over there, I think, are the ones that cause a lot of mothers and children to wonder if it's poison ivy. Now, that is or is not poison ivy? This is not. And this one, you see, has five leaflets. They're all attached at one common point here onto a petiole, onto a stem which goes down to the main stem. Now, I'm not going to pick the poison ivy like that, but it has three leaflets with, which are attached in the same way, coming into a common point, and the, the edges are, are very similar on mm -hmm. the two. But uh, this business of three and five is quite uh, significant. Now, both of these plants, both Virginia creeper with the five leaflets and poison ivy with the three, will be on the forest floor like this, crawling along, growing along. Uh, they may occur as vines growing up on houses or on trees, or they may look like short shrubs, uh, somewhat upright, maybe to anywhere between two and four feet high. 
So both the Virginia creeper and the poison ivy plant are alike in growth habit, uh, and they both obviously occur in the same kind of habitat, same kind of places. Now, I noticed that you were quite willing, and I'll be daring enough to get a finger this close, but now, um, actually, is it poisonous if you don't uh, uh, touch it, or is that debatable, depending upon the sensitivity of the person? Usually, you have to actually come in contact with it, except when you have uh, poison ivy material that is in a fire. If you're uh, having a, a picnic fire somewhere or clearing an area in the woods, if you get uh, poison ivy material, then the compound that people are sensitive to is volatile and it will be in the smoke. Ah, so, so that perhaps is so the way this is job. one way people can contact it without actually touching the plant. Mm -hmm. Well, now on to other leaves, but just be careful about this one. <laughs> we'll watch this one. <laughs> now, this leaf is, I think, a different tree, but it has some of the same uh, sort of edge as one of the trees the other day. Right. It looks very much like the um, both the ironwood uh, and the uh, hackberry that we were talking about the other day. And it has the same kind of leaf in that it is a simple leaf, uh, one flat green part, one petiole. And when we take a look at the stem here, there is a leaf here, a leaf here, one at each node, uh -huh. one at each point on the stem. So, and we said that there are plants where there is, um, there are two leaves attached at one point here. So we just, we'll start from this one again, and then this is basswood, incidentally. Mm -hmm. um, it's called uh, also uh, linden tree. Oh, These are two the names same for the same, the tree. same tree. And it has, um, a, it's a uh, very common uh, tree in the, in the slopes here in the woods. And often grows, you can see there are two trunks there in a cluster, and these are actually coming from the same root system. And often you'll see different size trunks uh, coming up from the same root system, so you get what look like a whole cluster of trees, but they're actually part of the same one. So uh, this this doesn't branch after it once has a central uh, trunk, like some other trees that may go up and then have their branches. That actually right. it almost branches from the root system. Almost, and this is one of the things that makes it perhaps uh, a little more difficult in terms of uh, lawn yeah. trees and things of this sort. All right, now maybe this was on the other, and I didn't get it. That little. The little green bump. fella there, yes. that little green bump, is the bud. Now this will be uh, where next year's leaves and stem would come from. And by, the, by this fall, this one which is bright green right now, will be a sort of a, a coral pink color. And so the winter buds, or when the, when the buds go into winter, they are actually a sort of a bright red. And they're very oh. handsome. But it's, it's much more prominent on this. It, it shows much better on then, this tree. Right? Now, is that unique for this tree, or is it just the time of the year? Uh, they're a little older than when we were looking mm -hmm. at them last, and also this one has bigger buds, mm -hmm. so it's got two things going for it. All right. All yeah. right, now, with this one in mind, let's move over here and take a look at this maple. Now, this, one's, this one is different. This one is different. This is uh, one of the maples. This is so-called hard maple, and as you can see, at each node back here on the stem, there are two leaves. Two here coming off in this plane, two here. And the, the basal part of the petiole here tends to, to sort of sheath around the stem, sort of encloses it much more than the other things we were looking at. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice the leaf itself is a very different pattern. And it has each one of these big areas here is called a lobe. And so this individual, this is a, still a simple leaf, but each the leaf has three lobes on this particular one we're looking at. And it doesn't have one big central uh, vein. That's right. We can see this perhaps Oops, a little better. That's our little friend. <laughs> see this better on the reverse side of the leaf here. You can see that there are, are three large veins. In fact, there are a couple of ones which almost qualify as being as big, uh, rather than having one main midrib vein as on the leaves we've been looking at before. So the vein pattern is quite different, too, and is characteristic of this particular kind of tree. Here again, this hard maple and the bass would be, would be trees which we'd commonly find on slopes here in central part of Iowa, like uh, the woods we're here in here today. Now, now one other thing before mm -hmm. we go to the other, though. Okay. Now, uh, on the other, we had the little buds, but now this doesn't have nearly the prominent buds that the other one did, and uh, it's exactly the same time of the year. Okay, now this one, they're, they're down in there, and if we took the, 
broke the petiole back, we could see them nestled right in here where the petiole attaches onto the stem. Mm -hmm. But uh, they, they haven't developed nearly as much. Mm -hmm. They won't be as big by next fall either. Now, beginning right here is this year's growth, okay, isn't it? Right. This much stem is this year's growth. How much do they usually grow a year? Or does it, this it, it varies a great deal on individual trees and on different parts of the same tree. Mm -hmm. This is down here in the shade, so I'm sure if we, you know, if we climbed up to the top of the tree, we could find some that were much larger even. Is that a disease? That's an insect. Now, these are opposites, but now right. th that one right there has opposites, too, and they look a little bit different. All right, let's get it down here. Oops. Now, you're right. You can see on the branches here, maybe we can see it on this one very nicely, there are two leaves here, two here, two here. Mm -hmm. And, but this much is one leaf on this. Right, and this much is one leaf here. Right. And you can see... They're, here again, they're small, but there's a bud right down there. And this is the way we tell that this much, I'll break this one off so we can take a look at it, is one entire leaf. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the, the petiole still, but each one of these flat green parts, which are separate, would be individual leaflets. Mm -hmm. So this is a so-called compound leaf because it has more than one flat green part. And more than that, it's called a pinnately compound leaf because there are leaflets attached here, here, and here. So they're attached at different places on the stem. Now, these are all important term, uh, terms if you're going to be looking up in the, in the tree book for identification, this sort of thing. Right. One of the first things uh, a tree book will, will ask you about in terms of the plant you're looking at is whether it has simple or compound leaves. Uh -huh. And so this is uh, one of the one of the beginning steps. If you miss that step, you you, you had a bad, you're, you're you've had a wrong spot. Right, and we'll have to get the details of, of of that particular type of tree at another time. Our guest has been Dr. Uh, Lois Tiffany with the Botany Plant Pathology Department at Iowa State, and we will continue perhaps another day. Not too long ago, Debbie Bull, our guest today, talked about equipment that should be part of camping, and she showed us the reflector oven and she showed us the Dutch oven, but I thought a lot of people actually don't know how to cook with them, and so Debbie is back with us, and uh, she is a junior at Iowa State, and you just finished getting the fire just about ready to the spot to work with the reflector oven. Right. Um, one of the things with the reflector fire is that you want bright flames because the whole point is is that the fire and the heat reflects off the inside. And you can see how the oven is built so that it reflects. And one thing it's easy to do is to build your fire down and then you, so, and then you want to back up here. This can be done in several ways. You can take two sticks and stretch aluminum foil across here. Or you can take two sticks and stack green logs up or another reflector oven variety of things. You can get by without any of these other methods by just keeping a high enough hot enough fire here. But you do have to be careful that when you don't have your reflector back here that um, you may have to adjust the distance that your oven is to your fire or move your fire a little bit because it can get too hot. And then it burns without right. cooking. <laughs> without cooking it on the interior. Now this uh, uh, reflector oven looks a little tiny bit different than some of the others. Right, this oven is moved just by the handle on top, and many ovens, which I'll show you one later, um, has a lid that lifts up in the back so that you can reach in from behind to turn your pan around instead of having to either move your oven out or reach in in front of the fire and turn your pan. Mm -hmm. All right, now you're going to fix some cornbread. Right. Then is this a mix, or did you make it yourself, or does it really make any difference? It doesn't really make any difference. I find it easier to mix all the dry ingredients at home, and then when you're out camping, you can mix the other ingredients, the, 
it would make it moist in and then you've got it all ready to put on and it's all pre-measured. Now you're using one of the Teflon pans that you have out of your camping equipment set, I think. Right. Um, I like I like the Teflon pans just because they're easy to clean. And this is cornbread. I don't know whether we said that or not. <laughs> Hopefully it's cornbread. <laughs> That's why it starts out, it might be right. mush. <laughs> it's supposed to be. And then you just, I think I'm going to move this out to take it out, slip it in, and then you set your oven back in. Now we'll have to build the fire back up so that there's flame shooting up so that it'll be reflecting. Debbie, how long does it uh, take uh, to cook? Well, it's kind of hard to say because every time you use a reflector oven or a Dutch oven, the temperature fire is always going to be a little bit different. Um, the reflection may not be the same. Wind will do strange things. You kind of have to watch it. And when you read your recipes at home or camping or whatever, it'll tell you what to look for, like a golden brown crust. And you use your knife, just like you would at home, and just stick it in the middle. And I'd say this will probably take about a half an hour. And so, now, it should brown in the same, to a certain extent, like it does in the oven. Right. It, it'll look, it should look just exactly as it does if you take it out of your oven at home, complete it. Now, are you going to ever have to turn this one around um, uh, within the oven? Right. Um, when you're using, cooking like this, especially without a reflector on this side, you need to keep turning it because you don't want to get this side will become dunner on the bottom where it's closer to the fire where the other side will tend to cook faster on top and you need to keep turning it. It will also help keep it level. And what does one do with such bees that drop in? <laughs> well, there's chocolate-covered ants and chocolate-covered bees will have a cornbread-covered cornbread bee. <laughs> right. You keep feeding the fire. Right. You want to keep a flame. This is a fairly good flame. Um, it can be varying degrees of higher or not. This one is almost too close, but because of the confines of the fireplace, we can't really move either one. Ideally, it should be about, the main part of the fire should be right about here. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't do this with charcoal, can you? This is hard to do with, with charcoal. I've never been able to because you need a flame, but you can use the Dutch oven, which I'll show you later, can be done with charcoal. Uh, needless to say, we've had about a 15-minute intermission here but while the cornbread baked. And, uh, Debbie, it now looks like it's about done. Right. And just like you do at home to test it, you stick your knife down in the middle. And since I can't get in from the back of this, I'm just going to lift it out. This protects hands from getting burned, which can ruin lots of camping trips. I think it's done. I think it looks like it's done. I think it does, too, and it looks good. <laughs> Oh, there's the finished product. Mm hmm. And then you just, of course, cut it and serve it. Now, if you needed something very quickly in the oven, you could set it on uh, at the side and keep it warm until the time. Right. And keep it into the uh, but if, as long as it stayed there, if you didn't have any little kids. Now, one thing that we wanted to uh, check, uh, let me reach this. And this was the other reflector oven, wasn't it? Right. This is another type. It's a little more sturdy, and, and this one is nice in terms of it um, won't fall apart on you because it's made to stay like this. This one is collapsible so that it folds up into just a small box, and it's easier for carrying, for backpacking, and just general camping, where this one is a little more cumbersome. Yes. Now, this one will fold up into this size box. So. Right. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and it's a little bit larger. It gives you a little more surface area to put your pan in here. Maybe I can show you by comparison. I'll just sort of, you can get your pan further in, which allows for a little evener baking. And you did, uh, we, we should say that you did for a minute or two put uh, some aluminum up to reflect into this particular fire, but I think uh, that would, uh, can be done depending upon the uh, situation that you have right. to deal with. And we thank uh, Debbie very much, Debbie Bull. Uh, she's a junior at Iowa State, and this is the work with the reflector oven. Now we will be moving on uh, for one now of uh, the Dutch oven, but that'll have to wait as far as you're concerned until tomorrow.